want to go. Mohamed, you're showing two projects in the exhibition space uh, with us at the moment. Uh, they are quite different uh, projects. Uh, there's the uh, Friday Mosque and the Park City. Uh, could you maybe say something about both of these uh, projects? First, maybe you could say something about the Park City project. Well, the Park City project is about a city in transition. Uh, and it's interesting uh, to, to, to know that Johannesburg is probably one of the only major cities in the world uh, that is not located on a natural feature, either a river or a sea. Uh, and, and this actually means that it actually lacks an identity that differentiates it from other major cities. Uh, what we have is a, is a wonderful opportunity with about almost 600 hectares of land uh, that becomes available over the railway line. Uh, this is the land that used to belong to the state. And with the changes coming in, as we brought back to the use uh, for the people that are using the city. Uh, the city is also starting to show its Africanness. That means from a, 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 from a phase when it was a city for white people with Eurocentric values. And uh, it is moves to an African uh, city in, in the true sense of the word. What we have is an opportunity almost like Austin and Sparrows, uh, where, where a city building at that scale could be possible. We propose an exercise of placement um, and we exploit an artificial topography that exists on the site of 10 meters to emphasize uh, this level shift and this space making exercise. So I think besides the social economic issues, I think mean, it combines a, a spatial uh, aspect to it. And, uh, this is, I think, the most... Uh, are, there any, are there any precedents for the kind of scale of intervention that you're involved with? Uh, I think there are none. Driver? I think there are none. Actually, that's the reason why almost, uh, the intervention had to be almost of a radical kind. Uh, and almost to, to expand on the culture of difference different to what exists already. And in some ways it also talks about manning the city or stitching the city back. The north is where the aspirations of the big city lie, uh, of the big business in the city lie. And the south is where uh, the aspirations of the previously marginalized people uh, live and work. So it's actually, the, the, the land actually represents the meeting of the north and the south. Uh, uh Given the, the scale of this intervention, and given, as you said yourself, that there are certain analogical similarities with, with sort of the whole process of Bosnianization, yeah. does that set up any problems for you? This this scale of intervention is it is it uh, do you encounter any problems with people who see this kind of project as being too radical, too Western in some sense? Uh, I'm not so sure if it's radical. It's, it's actually relates to place making and something that is suited to something that actually happens after experiencing the site. Uh, I think it's important to note that the site actually is, is like a river of steel, um, as opposed to the actual river. Uh, and it's actually, you have a vision of a valley that exists there. In reality, it's actually a ground that's been hollowed out. It's very attractive in place. When you build over it, you have a situation that what I'm speaking especially is a very special feature. Uh, we speak, we, we see, Envisage spaces and places, urban places that will be very unique to Johannesburg. Um, in Afrikaans, we call them ports, so almost breaks in ridges and cliffs that will sort of frame views of the city. And it also relates to place making instincts that are different in the savannah as opposed to a, a, a European temple forest where we sort of have what we call scented places. Um, also, what I envisage is these are citadels that will have uh, predominantly green spaces surrounding them. Ideally, the, the whole space, this kind of should be dedicated to a big lung for the city. Uh, economically, it won't, won't be able to be justified. What are some of the functions or uses that you envisage for this? Well, it also material. talks about creating a critical mass in the city, which actually means expanding, uh, so creating a viable inner city housing projects with a mixed use as the basis for it. Uh, so for the first time, we talk about a city that's going to work, both in terms of, uh, we have certain contradictions in the system. Only 15% of the people of the country own motor vehicles, whereas the whole city 
and all the services are designed to be used to have access only by one vehicle. Uh, the, the country operates on transport subsidization, which means the state spends almost two to three thousand rand, uh, which is equivalent to about four hundred pounds per person annually, to subsidize transport costs to move uh, uh, mainstream labor from peripheral areas into downtown. The critical mass is, 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 a, is, a, is an issue that urgently needs to be addressed. Are there other open spaces that are being developed now in Johannesburg that might not be of this scale, but speak of a move towards the uh, transformation of the urban center with green spaces, with, in a sense, sort of spaces for promenade and, and so on, for sort of public, public realm, in a way, the public space? Well, the public realm has always been where the vacuum has always existed. Um, and those that exist are very little. Uh, if you compare it to any other major cities, uh, the figure grounds will clearly indicate to you that uh, there's absolute lack of uh, public realm. Uh, this is an opportunity to make those special places with what I would call celebrated buildings or event buildings in place in these sort of green spaces. Um, and what we see there is that these are the places where people will congregate for use for the community to exchange rich stuff, um, both from the culture and the social point. Well, your Friday Mosque project is something very different in the sense that while the Park City project is, in terms of some of its uh, references, uh, probably one could say Western at this, at this stage, it seems, the, uh, the Friday Mosque really returns to the, the roots of, of Islamic architecture and in a, very, uh, in a very important part of the city. Could you speak a little bit about well, the circumstances of well, the building? I, I think before we talk of sort of a, a stylistic, almost a, a traditional aspect to it, I think it's important to know that the project uh, tries to achieve a, a, a public significance well beyond its, uh, its grief. And why I'm saying this is that it sort of copes with things like empowerment of building skills. The project specifically addresses itself to some of the very mediocre building skills that exist on the ground. A bricklayer is probably the most prolific tradesman available in the Silicon Valley industry. We're using a basic skill of uh, making straight walls and we're empowering people to suddenly make domes, vaults, fan vaults. And the same people are being transformed with skills that they can make their own houses with. So we're empowering mediocre laborers with skills that will allow them to build their own houses which is a big issue in South Africa. Uh, so the building site is in a sense a kind of school. A school also. Transference of skills. Uh, coming back to the issue of tradition, uh, I, I believe very clearly that when you work with sacred and, and, and sacred work and traditional aspect of I believe there's no room for innovation. And if there's any sort of innovation, it always happens within the standard. Um, Islamic architecture is a very strong language and the language is almost established. There's no room for innovation or creation of new words. Uh, and what I'm saying is that within that standard, you are correct. Uh, the design always happens within a parameter of the language to uh, It has also brought in other skills like uh, the community has been enriched through a process of building. Uh, both the community has been disenfranchised because it was black in terms of Black in terms of none, but in terms of what it means is marginalized communities, previously marginalized communities. Uh, and it's an opportunity for them to reclaim their position, both in terms of their existence in the city, from which they were moved out by the Group Areas Act. We have a unique phenomenon in South Africa where, due to spatial engineering, uh, the viable the local communities were moved out from city centers and moved to peripheral areas of the city. This also led to a duality in which two mosques have to be built, one for work and one for, for the rest of the city. Uh, this mosque actually works only as a workers' mosque because nobody lives in downtown anymore. We hope that with the establishing of projects like Park City, where people will be brought back into the city uh, and the environment quality will be improved, which will allow that mosque to function in the true sense. You've already mentioned something about the, the uh, social circumstances of, of this particular project, but I think it would be very interesting if you could elaborate on that in terms of the role of the, of the Islamic community 
in a way, in Johannesburg. How, how long has there been um, an Islamic community in Johannesburg? And, and what kind of role do they play in the, in the social structure of the city? Uh, I think it's, it's very interesting uh, to, to realize that lot of, this year we had our 300th uh, uh, year celebration of Islam in South Africa. Islam came to South Africa uh, with the coming of the Dutch as slaves to the Dutch. They came from Java. Uh, and the mosque in question was uh, a mosque site originally since 1870, where a tent structure which evolved into a corrugated iron structure, and a form of the first formal structure was built in 1914, uh, which was subsequently demolished in 1980 and 1990 uh, to make way for the new building. It relates to a community that uh, is plus minus. 2% of the total population of 45 million. In terms of its influence, both in terms of its culture, politically and socially, it has phenomenal influence. Uh, a community that is probably the oldest westernized Islamic community. How does that affect your own work? Uh, uh, do you find that you have, in a way, kind of allegiance with other folks who are working uh, in, in South Africa or different different kinds of projects? Or do you find that in, because of the, the mosque project, for example, we now have to reach out to uh, a group of people outside of South Africa? I, I think it's important to, to sort of, uh, speak about how we actually practice architects in South Africa. And I think in some ways it's very really different. Uh, Architecture as, a, uh, architecture as a profession for a black person would be very difficult because his patrons would be very few and would only be drawn from the community purely because in reality the profession has been very much what I would call a white gentleman's profession in South Africa. Uh, from a total of 4,000 architects, there are only 40 black architects in the country. And uh, I think that sort of gives you the inequalities that exist, just in, both in terms of numbers and in terms of job opportunities that exist out there. This is related to doing a lot of work on a community basis, uh, almost on a gratis basis. Uh, I think the mosque represents almost doing 48 buildings in rural and developmental communities uh, at no, no sort of formal fee structures, working and experimenting with uh, masonry, which is the most obvious choice as a material, because it, require, uh, it, it sort of makes use of a skill that exists already on the ground. Clay is, is a thing that's found all around us. We, we burn the bricks and it's made. Uh, so the project is not a freak in some ways. It's, it's a process that has actually almost started since 1984. And it's a combination of a technology that is matured to form the building. Uh, coming back to the issue of uh, the social issues, uh, the, my, my work has varied from both doing uh, very formalistic residential buildings for Indian clients. Uh, Indian community which has been a traditionally economically based community uh, with very strong economic uh, leanings have tried to show their identity via formalistic expressions of housing. And they've been big patrons of architectural expression. Uh, I think it's probably a search for identity, a uh, search to find some sort of uh, face within a, a, a blanket of anonymity which the state is will spread over there. They were moved to peripheral areas, uh, which was uh, savannas or sort of very hostile landscapes with a horizon that overpowered anything you built on them. And so formalism became a, a view for them. One of the arguments about regionalism, uh, which points to a, a, a particularization of differences, would have never worked because it would have actually played into the hands of the people that oppress them for many years because they use regionalism as an argument for their apartheid policy. So the universality or the universalism of their formal approach was based on the fact that they aspired or they, they looked at the outside world for some sort of rescue to their plight. Can you tell us something about your office? Um, how is the office organized? I run, a very small, I run a very small office uh, doing work from 100 million rand in scale. How much is that in pounds? In pounds, it would be about 20,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. 
That sounds a lot more. That's kind of easy, right? Yes. And uh, going down to a, a small operation that might take uh, 5,000 pounds. So we, we do an incredible scale and variety of work. Uh, I still work on a very, uh, 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 very disciplined system where most of the work is done by me. And where expertise is needed, we go out and get it for our project as opposed to hiring and firing people. Do you get students involved in this yes, work? Yes, we do. Or you I, I think it's important to know that I'm the Vice President of the Association of Black Architects and an organization that was set up in particular to empower and to create a network with marginalized uh, black professions um, to, to reconsider their position, to even lobby, uh, to correct some of the inequalities that exist. And, uh, and it, 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 it relates and it addresses specifically the anomalies of the profession uh, and, and, and to try and educate the communities that we belong to about the role of architects. Uh, we also have a site in the community uh, in South Africa that is what I would call the legacy of apartheid is that we, our own people don't believe in black professions. Uh, and this has got to do with a, a, site, uh, a site that has been inherited due to apartheid. How do you position your own work in relation to the three other people whose work we're exhibiting at the moment, Victoria, Bobby, and Joe? Uh, I, I think uh, just without, I mean, I, I know Joe's work more than the other two, actually, but I think uh, my roots are very formalistic, and I think it relates to, to the way we were taught. Uh, it also relates to a shallowness that actually uh, existed in, in South African society during the 80s. Um, the sort of materialistic culture that, that people resorted to in a sort of formalistic uh, exhibition as opposed to a, a more relevant approach. Uh, but I think one thing that always guided our work and probably this is unique to me and that I always aspire to is sort of the uniqueness of the place many instincts of the Savannah or Johannesburg where I come from which is very different from probably Cape Town, which is uh, probably very similar to a temple forest of Europe, uh, where instead of clearing the forest to make a building, uh, you make a building and, and a centered building, which has to create its own context by various means, by buildings relating to each other, planting trees, the way you approach a building, uh, by blanking out the horizon because you, you could never compete with the horizon. The power of the horizon is so strong. Uh, I think these were the issues, but I think the other big issues was relevance and appropriateness. And a lot of it related to simple issues like technology. Detail because of the lack of appropriate people to build the sophisticated structures that we were trained to do in reality you couldn't. Uh, a thing that really worried me always was we were asking people to build buildings that was alien to them as the cities that we were forced to live in. Concrete, asking concrete structures for something very alien to the people that we excluded from a, a, a living process because of the group areas and because of the Job Reservations Act, which prevented black people from inherit or, or, or gathering skills which allowed them to work as artists in the classroom. I think these projects, obviously working in South Africa, give you an incredible perspective in terms of how architecture should be practiced. I wonder whether you could uh, give us a sense of some of the work that you might appreciate in the West, uh, but again, because of you know, based on your, uh, based on your experience in South Africa. Uh, you know, one of the one of the sort of specialities that exist in South Africa is that we have an opportunity to pioneer a lot of new theories. Or what has been theory in the West is a chance to actually test them out. Uh, a lot of the stuff issues to relate to Mario Gonzalez's theories about uh, the American city, and it relates to very much to South African cities, which are probably closer related to. The American model as opposed to the Euro European model, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and probably if there's a chance to understand them and to explore them, I think that those opportunities exist in South Africa. Similarly, uh, the, the, sort of the European and the American fascination with uh, debating and uh, sort of this, this obsession with uh, debate, we have a situation where delivery, delivery and technique has become our obsession purely because the need is so big and the, the, there's an urgency in terms of doing things. So we have less time to discuss and debate things as, as much as we would like to debate and discuss things with each other. Uh, 
the housing issues are so critical. Uh, they're almost in the, in the verge of starting off a, 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 a revolution or in, in, in some ways or the other. Are you involved in teaching? No, no. And, and a lot of it relates to to a exclusionary uh, framework that existed, which actually excluded us from teaching, from participating in what was actually taught to us. Uh, I'll give you a very simple idea. For me to attend to university, I need to get a special state permit from the government, which allowed me allowed me to you know, study at a university, which was basically exclusively for whites or Europeans. Uh, and these were the circumstances which we studied. Uh, we were sort of marginalized both, marginalized both in terms of numbers and both in terms of the appropriateness of the programs. Is that changing now? Or are well, changes slow? Architecture being still very much an elitist profession in South Africa uh, has very few sort of, uh, patrons within the black community, purely because it's something that they don't understand uh, in terms of how it works, because this relates to basic issues of shelter. Before we can get into more definite issues of formalism, um, I, I think a lot of the challenges in South Africa relate to, to placemaking, placemaking instincts, to creating privileged space, which can make people forget or even soften the impact of the scholar and the poverty from which they come from. Well, Mohamed, I would like to thank you very, very much for coming to the AA and for the exhibition. I'm sure that our students will really benefit greatly from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, not Some to have people stuff. chatting. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I could hear. Okay, but it's running now. Okay, thank you. Well, Joe, thank you very much for coming to the AA. Uh, you're showing three projects at the moment in the exhibition uh, downstairs. It would be great if you could just tell us something about the circumstances of these two different projects and the kind of opportunities that each one of these things, in a, in a sense, brings about. Well, yeah, the, the three projects um, that um, I sent over here for the exhibition really represent, are really located in three very distinct parts of the city. Um, the, the first project is in the centre of the city and it's an attempt to rehabilitate and reconstruct the city as a place where people don't just work but also live. Um, the, the second project, which is at the Funda Centre, is really in a fairly typical township environment. It's in Soweto, near Barakwanath Hospital. And um, there, I think you, you can have a, a technology is fairly conventional, which is what one finds throughout that part of the city. And the third project is, is really located right on the periphery of the city, and it's a, um, a, 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 an AIDS counselling clinic and it's located in the shack settlement and really the technology there is a very basic shift technology capital program by new shooting and um, it's a very um, basic building type and in a way what intrigues me about our city is the way in which as you move further away from the city so the nature of buildings change and the kind of technology that's employed in those buildings has changed so unfortunately Unfortunately, if you want to call it that, in South African cities, because of the application of apartheid planning, the poorest people were spatially agglomerated in terms of race, and they dropped on the periphery of the city. So what you have are huge concentrations of people of high identities far away from the city centres, which is a complete reverse that you find in traditional cities, particularly in Europe. Can you speak in more general terms about what it's like to practice as an architect in South Africa and some of the differences between practicing in South Africa and Europe, maybe? Um, I, 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 I think it's uh, very, very, very different in the sense that, if I give you an example, I, I run a very small practice. Um, there's myself and three other people who work in the practice. Um, over the last 10 years, we've probably produced maybe just over 200 buildings, which means that we are making 20 buildings a year on average. Um, so the scope for actual building 
uh, is, is much greater than you find in Europe. Um, it's very hectic. Uh, one spends all this time on building sites, designing, making up detailed drawings. Um, the thing that uh, I find quite exciting as well is that you get a, a great mixture of different sorts of opportunities in South Korea as much as um, I do work for Shack settlements, advising them on how to uh, negotiate with local authorities to get basic services provided to them. And I'll drive from that site to um, the site of a new residence that I'm building for someone who maybe uh, is a business person in the city who's just come back from Spain, has seen the, the latest building done by the latest Spanish superstar, and has come back and said he wants a staircase just like you can find in that house. So there's this kind of schizophrenic, this kind of split sense of living in many different worlds simultaneously. And I find that quite exciting. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly very challenging, and uh, I, I don't think that you find that in Europe. Certainly in Europe it's a kind of sameness to most things. There's a sameness to the kind of time body that one deals with. Um, and in South Africa, um, it, 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 it's quite different. I think also what's important about that is, is that one has to live in those different worlds in South Africa in order to survive as an architect, because you simply cannot make a living simply servicing the needs of poor communities because most of the work that we do in those communities is on a pro day basis. So the single family homes in fact subsidize Absolutely. Is some of your life. You know, kind of Robin Hooding your way through through life. Um, and, and, and certainly I mean I, 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 it's for me quite interesting there have been lots of debates with colleagues about you know whether it's moral to design a sort of extensive individual house. And I am not really worried about that. I mean I think it's provided the use to which the house is being put is a is a reasonable use. I don't have a problem if someone wants to spend. I, I, I have a problem in the sense that it's it's crazy in a society that someone can, has two million rand to spend on a house, and two million rand could buy you maybe fifty low cost housing units. Something clearly I'm, you know, problematic with that society, but that's a political issue which one has to engage with in a different arena from the architectural arena. Putting aside the sort of the ethical dimension of, of, of this question, do you have any, any preferences in terms of the kind of architecture that, that you produce, let's say, for the single family home versus the, the community based projects? Are these, are these similar architectures as far as you're concerned? And do you feel that because of the difference in circumstance, you as an architect also end up producing different kinds of architecture responding to, uh, to the second? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think there's a certain kind of sameness in the sense that the the work is uh, you know, driven by the same sets of concerns. Um, uh, you know, for example, in, in, in the practice, we're very concerned about making an appropriate architecture, and because of the apartheid past, we're certainly very aware, of, uh, very wary of mimicking um, kind of form, just simply for form's sake. Because I think form in South Africa, architectural form is highly explosive. So we kind of adopt a very pragmatic line and we use available technology, we work with the climate and, and so on. So that there's a kind of sameness that emerges in the work. Um, and I wouldn't see them as very different. Um, I mean I, I have no problem dealing with a single um, family house. No, but the reason that I ask the reason that I asked this question, going back to your point about the latest staircase. It seems that, um, that that somebody might import or would wish you to, uh, oh, to, yeah. to import from from Spain. It seems that in the in the projects that you're showing, there is in fact a very particular uh, kind of attention that's given to details, choice of materials, and so yeah. on. And whereas the other kind of work seems or sounds at least, not having seen it, more stylistic in terms of what your clients might want to do. And uh, oh, yeah. this I think is a very interesting. <laughs> issue whether it actually no. visually produces different kinds of work? No, look, um, I mean, we're, we're quite hard asked in our practice in the sense that, uh, I mean, I use that more as a kind of point of illustration. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone came to us and told us that that was what we had to do, we'd tell them to stuff. Um, we'd tell them that we would prefer mm -hmm. to work with them and invent something that was appropriate to them, taking into account the experience of what they'd seen, but certainly, um, try and remove it stylistically from that. I think that um, that question, I mean, we can have a general debate about style. Um, I, I don't want to get involved in that debate, but what I, what I do want to really say is that um, I think we have a possibility of a new beginning in South Africa. 
And in a way, in the process of reconstructing our country, we have to reconstruct our culture, particularly our architectural culture. And I think the way in which we're going to find that point of entry to start doing that is really to move back to first principles. And uh, that means, in a way, freeing ourselves from the sort of stylistic influences of external forces and working with pretty pragmatic issues. So well, one of the things you just mentioned, it's here, one of the things that, that seems very interesting to, to, to me, and I think it's, it seems like a very important point in, in, uh, in, uh, in your work, is precisely this choice of materials. Can you speak to this question of materials in your work and the way in which materials <coughs> themselves lead to different uh, formative uh, possibilities or give, give rise to, if you like, new forms? Uh, than some of these materials have been traditionally associated with. What do you find interesting in working with uh, so-called, sometimes inexpensive materials? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it all comes from a very simple beginning, which is that uh, a number of years ago, uh, as a practice, we were involved in a great deal of work in uh, shack settlements, assisting people in um, providing, uh, in getting basic essential services to their houses. And at that stage, there was a great big debate in South Africa about uh, where we could find uh, an authentic South African architectural culture. And there was a lot of uh, experimentation by um, uh, a number of architects looking at rural architectural forms, such as independent housing and so on, so trying to find ways of reinventing them to suit a sort of urban context. And all of that kind of sounded and felt false, and particularly the people for whom this kind of work was intended, it was rejected in many cases. And what we suddenly connected with was the idea that in the Shack settlements, you had for the first time, I think, the beginnings of an authentic urban culture emerging, because here you had people outside the war acting for themselves and making things for themselves free of any external influences. And what we then decided to do was to say, well, let's look at the technology they use, let's look at the materials they use, and let's actually see how they're doing it. And then let's say to them, look, you've got a good beginning. And we're going to help you now develop that beginning and try and make it into something more formal. So that really was where this whole uh, fascination with using corrugated sheeting, applying the panel and so on came from. And I mean, I, I, I still believe in that. I think that the shack settlements are the most visible um, form that we have in our cities of the change that's happened to our cities over the last 10 to 15 years. 95% of all the housing produced in South Africa last year was produced by people in shack settlements building for themselves. And there's a standard form to how they do it. So something is happening. And uh, I think it was then from that that we moved on to frame systems on which you hung uh, the corrugated cheating. So in a way, um, in a strange way, I think that that interest emerged not out of forms of architectural, architectonic ideas, but it rather emerged from looking at how people do things for themselves and then saying, well, how can we help them legitimize what they're doing for themselves informally by making it into a full expression. Staying with the question of materials, then, could you claim the same thing about the, the, the use of color in, in, in your work? That seems to be a much more deliberate and, if yeah. you like, <coughs> formal uh, uh, follow certain kind of desires must do on your part in terms of selection of colors, choices, and so on. How, what, what kind of role does color play? Well, it, it, it depends. In, in, in many of the buildings that uh, we've done, the community buildings that we've done, the colour scheme that we've used is the colour scheme of the old ANC uh, flag, which was uh, green for the country, uh, gold for the wealth under the soil, and black for the people. So we used a green, yellow, and black um, colour scheme. And it's extraordinary. I mean, it's symbolically very really powerful because it represents um, liberation. Um, in the case of, say, something like the Planned Parenthood Association building in Orange Farm, um, what you have there is a very dull, uniform, single-story scale with no public buildings at all. So we took what is essentially a very small building and verticalized it and then painted it in a very bright color, which happened to be blue, which also happened to be the, the color of, of PPA. Um, and what we wanted to try and do is mark some urban scale in that kind of very undifferentiated mass and give some kind of center to, 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 to that settlement. And it seems to have worked well because just simply the fact that we've painted it in a bright color and it's much taller than most of the surrounding buildings has made it a kind of attraction for a lot of informal traders and others who come there to sell stuff, people meet there. They talk about, you know, I'll meet you by the blue building. You know, and 
So that's really what it is. Take to make it open like that. I read in an interview which you gave, I think, some time ago, uh, your very much of a sort of disagreement with the whole discussion of, of, of ethnicity and sort of the role of ethnicity in, in, in architectural considerations. Uh, why do you feel that, that, that ethnicity shouldn't really play uh, a role in, <coughs> in architectural design? Well, I, I think that the, the reason why I say that is that um, I say it in the context, the unique context of South Africa. In as much as we've emerged from you know, 40 years of apartheid rule, where I mean, the basis of apartheid was to separate people on the basis of um, you know, ethnic categories. And um, I think that uh, in many, many ways, uh, in this, the, the drive now to create a truly non-racial um, uh, democracy in South Africa, people are, are choosing to, 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 to stand apart from being described necessarily in terms of their ethnic origins because it has the ring of the past in it. And um, what I'm really concerned about then is to say, well, if we have to abandon that, there's many, many black friends I have found that offensive, you know, the, the Bailey, you know, uh, what, you know, the, the way you appropriate in the Bailey cultures, you place a, you design, you, you, you draw a zigzag pattern on the um, kind of external wall of the house and suddenly it becomes appropriate. I'm, 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 I'm offended by that and I, and I find that has no, uh, uh, it's not appropriate. The other thing is that much of the ethnic um, architecture which uh, one finds in South is essentially rural. And the transformation that happens in people's lives and the move and the migration from a rural to an urban environment is profound. And if you look at what is happening in the cities and compare it with what happens in the rural areas, there's no connection. Generally, there isn't. So I'm really saying that if we want to find urban expression, then what we have to do is look at what people are doing on the ground for themselves. And we have to do it free of any ethnic preoccupations about whether this person comes from the north or the south or the middle or the, 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 the periphery. Mm -hmm. um, there was a great deal of trivialization that occurred under the apartheid where you had, for example, you know, architects designing kind of pretty dumb boxes and then painting them in so-called ethnic colors in order to appropriate them and make them into ethnic objects. I, I think that's really what I'm talking about being offended by. Um, I, I think that if you go into any of the townships in South Africa today, you'll find a really kind of bustling culture, a really kind of exciting kind of environment to be in. And it's something that is not yet well formed. It's in a process of forming itself. And what I'm interested in as an architect is to try and understand what it is that's happening there and then give support to that, rather than come up with some kind of preconceived notion about what it should be on the basis of past experience. That's why I sound that more. Well, that sounds, that, sounds, that sounds very interesting, but then at the same time, it seems that maybe it's a question of degree. Oh, absolutely. Because, because obviously the idea of trivialization is something that you would all try to avoid, but are there certain circumstances where there are certain patterns that might be not so explicit, but more implicit, that remain as part of the cultural conditions, which might then be uh, thought of in the, in the process of, of, uh, of design development? Uh, I find this thing interesting because when I look, for example, at the Salisbury Plain housing, we often, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the kind of origins of that of that kind of housing and that, that type of that type of project. But in the absence, for example, and this might be just simply because of because of the way the exhibition is, is organized, absence of plans, uh, it, one would have to make the assumption that this is still dealing with a kind of continuation of a project of modernism in one sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you, you also have a certain fondness for, for Scandinavian uh, modernism. Now, that placed in juxtaposition to a sort of project of ethnicity with a question mark seems to, to, to open to a certain, certain level of, 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 of discussion, certain room for debate, which I find very interesting how you react to that. Um, how is the work seen, for example, by the local uh, community? Aren't there, uh, isn't there a problem that at times it might be seen as too much of an importation of a sort of Western ideal of, of housing? Those are some of the kinds of questions. I know there are too many questions at one, but I just think that it's, it's related to the, to the whole issue of, of responding to kind of local cultures in a way. 
Uh, I, to give you an example, I, I'm sorry, but you'll, you'll find some plans around the corner. <laughs> um, the, 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 I, I, I think what you say is both true, um, but then uh, it, it has to be debated. Um, first of all, the only examples we have in our city in Johannesburg of viable urban housing are, is, is, is uh, housing that was occupied by essentially Indian traders from the turn of the century up until the 1960s. And this housing was essentially courtyard housing, in which the focus of the housing was entirely on the courtyard. Now, what we did, for example, the Salisbury Plains, um, uh, you know, I'd argue that it comes from a different set of concerns. Um, our cities are pretty dangerous. We want to re inhabit the cities with people. We have, uh, uh, in a way, a captive audience for this project because they are all people who employ their white collar workers employed by large banking institutions who live in places like Soweto that want to be in the city. The single most important preoccupation they have is with security. So the thing about how you make houses in the city and provide a secure environment where, and this was a point raised continually in discussions with our potential um, householders, was that they would like to feel that they, the, hus the husband and the wife could leave their kids in the housing complex and go shopping in town and know that the kids are safe. And I think the thing that emerges from that is simply the courtyard form, where everything opens into the courtyard and you create private, semi-private and public space. Um, the, the other thing that we then worked on was to take the courtyard area and lift it one level above the street, which makes it even more secure. And then one looks at the climate of Johannesburg, which is a savannah of dry climate, and what you want to do is you want to create courtyard spaces to act as heat sinks for daytime heat so it can be radiated to the surrounding buildings at night time to reduce your energy costs and heating because we have great diurnal variation in Johannesburg. So I suppose you're right. Culturally, you could say that forms come from very different sources, but I would argue very strongly with you that I would say the forms would arrive in response to the whole process of negotiation with the people who want to live there kind of needs that they had and working with context, climate and, and, and so on, and that this form arose as a result of it. So um and you must just take a word for it. <laughs> <laughs> well um I know that somewhere else also following from this yeah. line of thinking, you've emphasized the the, the importance uh, that you pay to use in the in the, the whole question as opposed to function. Uh, mm. something that, that would come from, from modernism again, mm. uh, but use, uh, which is a very interesting, very interesting notion. Given the way, though, that you articulate this concept of use, and just the way that you describe, for example, the uh, the uh, Salisbury Claim housing project, don't you think that there there is uh, a way in which uh, there, there's a kind of process of naturalization or naturalism, because everything is somehow explained in relation to very pragmatic mm. circumstances. And then that combined with your, uh, with your, uh, in a sense, allergy towards uh, theory, results in, in an architecture which you try to, to somehow make it be resistant to uh, to theorization, to theoretical stimulation. Uh, don't you think that it's necessary for this work, despite its uh, uh, reference to, to use that it should still be ultimately theorized, uh, or, or would you argue that that it is? It must be the kind of the continuity of these use concerns and pragmatic concerns that should be the, the source of the work. <coughs> I, I, I think um, you're absolutely right, but I wouldn't hope to be as presumptuous. I, I have a, I have a view um, about architectural practice, which is that it's an intensely private pursuit, whilst at the same time being incredibly public. And the way in which I would choose to explain my work would be in the most prosaic, pragmatic ways, in ways that I could defend, and the ways in which I could explain in an objective way and engage in an objective, rational discourse with someone else. The kind of deeper theoretical issues that might have in the work, I hope would be apparent in the work. The fact that they are there or they are not there is not for me to elucidate or to dis it, It's fine if we can have a debate, because we're having a debate about that. I can talk to you about all the kind of um, uh, dreams I've had about all sorts of wonderful propositions about the books I've read, about the buildings I've seen, about the issues that concern me. 
But I would hope that maybe a drawing or a building would rather explain that than for me to have to make it apparent. I think that becomes, I, I become quite covert um, in the sense that I, I also like to, like to believe there's a necessity to disguise things, necessity to sort of not make things that apparent. And it's only through kind of teasing and coaxing and discussion that things can become apparent. So um, I, I wouldn't in any way suggest that by simply following a pragmatic, prosaic line which takes use in the celebration of use as the only source of architectural form, that that's how you make form and how you make adequate, satisfactory form. I think there are far more mysterious things that happen. Um, for me to explain that to you would take a long time. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes, good. Maybe we should move a little bit to the, to the sort of the political arena. I'm wondering whether the recent transformations in the political structure of South Africa has made any major changes in the way you practice in the production of your own work, the kinds of buildings that you produce? Um, I, I think that uh, what has happened is that I, I find myself caught in a kind of um, d dilemma in the sense that um, prior to uh, you know, the, the election of the government of national unity, um, I refused to have any work, I have anything to do with any government services, kind of part of departments, you can sit on the basis that they were not represented the people of the country. And um, I was highly critical of those architects who used their political and family connections to get work through the broader bond of the National Party. Now um, I'm in a position where I have friends in the government. In a way, I'm really resistant and reluctant to take advantage of the fact that I know people in order to get work. So what I've done is I've taken a step back. And the result of that is, is that we do have a certain amount of work that's coming from the government, but not, not a lot of it. But I think that that applies to most architects because the new state, the new government is really restructuring most of the government departments and it's a pretty difficult bureaucratic process that they have to follow. And I think that work is really only going to flow in the next couple of years. What we found with the work that we've done though is that in the period from say the early 80s to the 90s, early 90s, a lot of the work that we got, we got from non-governmental organizations in the country who were funded massively from external um, agencies and really their job was to provide the sort of services the state was to provide for disadvantaged communities. And about 90% of our work was involved with the NGO sector. Now that's all dried up because the um, reconstruction development program, all the external funding has been redirected to the RDP program. And the NGOs are really suffering at the moment because they have very little financial support. Um, so we're doing very, very little NGO work. And curiously enough, all of a sudden we've become a fashionable practice. And we're doing work for all sorts of sort of interesting people. We did an office building for a, a film production company, an international film production company. We did sort of different work from what we've done in the past. But I really see it as simply a, um, a, an interim phase. Once the uh, RDP program starts moving, um, we're doing a lot of um, art centers. Well, we've been commissioned, but we haven't yet received to go ahead to uh, four or five art centres and, and a number of schools. And I think once that program starts and the funding becomes available, I think we'll be very, very involved once again in, in, in that kind of architecture. But it's for me a kind of interesting diversion for a couple of years. What about the relationship of the practice to other practices in, uh, in South Africa? Are, you, are there <coughs> any mechanisms for collaboration, for debate, for doing, doing joint projects? Uh, um, uh, well, first of all, um, I, I teach at the university, so uh, in, in, in many ways the kind of debates that I, happen, I have happen with the students, and being fortunate in that one can be involved in the practice, we produce a lot of buildings, what one does is use the buildings for, for teaching. And one's continually having slideshows of students showing the work that one's doing and entering into debates, and so for me, I, I kind of, the, the debate you know, the dimension of debate and discussion is very full. I find students a hell of a lot more likely than practitioners. Practitioners are usually quite dead. They're worried about kind of um, uh, bank overdrafts and cash flows and stuff. When they seem to get over 40, they seem to be excited the fact that they're architects, they become business people. Um, uh, as far as collaboration is concerned, we're involved in a couple of projects. We're doing work in different parts of the country. We're doing two sports centres, one in Cape Town and the other in East London. And in both cases, we're working in association with local architects. Um, 
But it, it's funny, I think that what you find emerging in Europe is that people go into association on very large projects, either through competitions or whatever. There's so much work in South Africa that one is occupied all the time just dealing with the work that one has on, you know, in, in one's own office. It certainly would be nice to work with other people. And so do you find that now some of your students are beginning to set up their own practice oh, yeah. to have this kind of work? Because what, what we've heard is that, in fact, most of the people leaving the university, they do go into the more kind of conventional or traditional offices and there might not be enough people uh, uh, entering the, the slightly more, more experimental or unconventional practices. I, 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 look, I, I think um, that, that what is happening now is essentially that the, the focus of the construction industry has been redirected by the new government and that the major production is going to occur in, 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 in the production of social facilities. And most architectural practices in South Africa recognize that they've all realigned themselves. Um, I think that what you're going to find in South Africa is that uh, if you take a city like Johannesburg, where it's probably very similar to most other large cities of its kind elsewhere in the world, you're going to find three or four very large commercial practices who will be able to produce at great speed pretty standard commercial buildings that uh, fast track their construction and that then the vast majority of other architectural practices will be small single person practices who team up with each other in tandem where they get larger work. And that's the pattern that seems to be emerging in Johannesburg now. So the trend is towards small practices, the reduction of overheads and the ability then that, that practice to service the needs of a poorer client community than they have traditionally dealt with in the past. Well, Joe, thank you very, very much for coming to the AA and for giving us the opportunity to see you very far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Are we just have physical dates? And that's your sure. sure. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry if I sort of slipped past your question. I don't know what you're about. It's great. I'd love to uh, <coughs> chat. I don't know how you.